this last summer until now. And we want to welcome all of you in this one service to uh, connect with our family. As we walked in, you must have noticed there are tents and booths set up there. These are 15 different ministries of AGIF. We have for men, women, kids, youth, and so on. We, all of those ministry and ministry leaders, their volunteers, will be out there in those booths. And if you are new to Abundant Grace, please don't leave uh, until you connect with and meet with people. And those who are here for some time, they will be serving you as well. And so this afternoon, this is our special way of welcoming all of you to this um, wonderful, wonderful service and the family of Abundant Grace. I want to begin with showing you this picture of a wild fig tree that is in Echo Caves in South Africa. Any, any South Africans here? I know, I, I know a number of South Africans here. If you have heard about this, this Echo Caves have this amazing wild fig tree that's been there for as long as we know. It's been there growing every year. It just gives fruits and it's growing. The beauty about this fig tree is that in the Guinness World Record, this fig tree has found its place. Because so far as excavation has been done, people have found out that this fig tree has the roots that has grown deeper to about 400 feet down. It's about 120 meters at the Echo Caves. If you know Echo Caves are 40 kilometers long and people have been allowed to go into the cave up to two kilometers and people who went inside have found that this thing in the cave, this tree is growing its root up to 400 feet down. The next picture. Could you show the next picture, please? This tree is growing its deep roots into 400 feet down. I want to show you another picture. This is the picture of Burj Khalifa in Dubai, an 828 meters high tower with 163 stories. And this is the tallest man-made structure on earth. With, 100, with our 2,716 feet or 828 meters high. When you go and study the structure being built over six years, there is something that no one has seen in the world except the engineers and the architects who are working, and that is this one. This is the foundation of that massive, massive structure. And I've been reading about these structures, how they have been built. It took about 15 months for, the, for about 700 engineers and its team to build this basement or the, uh, or the foundation of this in this format. The next picture will show you how this has been built. There are about 50 meters down 164 feet deep. There are 192 pillars with 1.5 meter diameter. Over 45,000 meter cube of concrete weighing 110,000 tons were used just to put that foundation. Why am I showing these pictures? You wonder, I'm neither an architect nor a farmer. I want to, you to know that these pictures are a framework for us to understand what well, we're going to start a new journey from today for the next several weeks. In fact, what we are planning to do is to keep this theme for the entire year, not to preach on the same topic, but we're going to keep this theme of being rooted and built up. We just heard from the video this scripture, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving. Biblical writers 
Both Old Testament and New Testament uses imageries and metaphors for us to understand the spiritual truth that God wants to understand from the word. Jesus used parables. Paul uses multiple metaphors. And prophets used many analogies and imageries to tell what God wants to speak to us. They are from everyday life. Last year when we started our journey in September, we kept the theme as growing together. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, we want to grow together. And that was taken from the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and 3. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, what is it that you would take us to next level? And he said, get rooted. Get rooted and being built up in the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. As we continue our spiritual journey of growing together in Shanghai, I want to invite all of us as a church to understand what it means to be rooted and built up. Why we need to root ourselves and be built up. Why is Paul writing these letters in Colossians and asking people that you have started this journey, we need to grow rooting into Christ. And that is our theme for the year, rooted and lift up, uh, built up. This is what we're going to uh, look at in the next few weeks. And then uh, in the coming months, we look at a few habits that we can develop as global disciples. How to be getting rooted in him, rooted in Christ. When you start the book of Colossians, which Apostle Paul wrote, and he was telling his disciples in there, in Colossae, a small city near the coast of Agency, and today's Turkey, a small city compared to many other cities in that Asia Minor region. Colossae was a small city. In fact, Paul did not found that church. He's one of his disciples. Epaphras went to this city and started this young church. And Paul, when he was in prison, either in Ephesus or in Rome, he writes this letter from prison to encourage the believers whom he hasn't seen. But he heard about their growth, their, uh, their calling into Christ and their believing in Jesus. And he wrote this beautiful letter, just four chapters. I would encourage you for the next few weeks, spend some time reading and meditating on this book called the book of Colossians. And what we are going to do is to keep this theme in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 as the theme for studying this book because this is a center part of what Paul is writing. Paul's writing is that believers, you have begun your journey. Your journey is to follow Christ. You have received Jesus as the Lord. I have put this, some colors to understand how he is writing this letter. He says, so then, just as you receive Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving. In chapter 1, verse 28, Paul says, my desire as a pastor, as a missionary, as I am writing this letter, is that you will all grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ. I want to see every believer being built up into the fullness of Christ. I want to present you perfect in Christ. That's the word he uses in chapter 1 verse 28. And in chapter 2, when he began, he started applying those truths and he says, if you want to be perfected in Christ, there is something that you need to do. And that's what we're going to look at today. He begins by saying, just as you have received Jesus Christ as the Lord. I want you to think about that three words, Christ, Jesus, Lord. This is not just a following. This is not just a accepting Jesus, God, I want to go to heaven kind of thing. Paul says, you have received Jesus Christ, not just as your savior from death, but you are receiving Jesus Christ as the Lord and master. 
You, you are telling God, Jesus, I want you to be my master. In fact, in the Greek, trans, the Greek writing, this is, this is even more of an imperative statement. He says, since you have received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to walk in him. In other words, if you have begun this journey with Jesus, you cannot stop. There are no options for us. If you began this commitment to Christ, you need to continue to live in Jesus Christ. Salvation in the New Testament, even in the Bible, as a whole Bible when you study, you see salvation is not just getting out of the hell and somehow to make our way to heaven. Salvation is, an, is a living relationship experience. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ as the Lord of our life. And then Paul is writing this particular community in Colossae. Now I want you to think about this. It's 2,000 years ago in the near uh, Mediterranean region, there were many pagan worship practices, philosophies that were growing. So anytime when the faith, the Jesus' gospel message comes to a new city, people who are believing in other faith will come to believe and they will try to connect their faith and the faith in the gospel. And that, that's what we call syncretistic, syncretism. What happens is that you try to mix with the common practices of the cultural practice of the people with the gospel message. And that's one group of people doing in that city. For example, when you read chapter 2, we will see people were thinking that, oh, we need to have a secret knowledge of God. In order for that secret knowledge, we need to practice asceticism. We want to deny all the things. That's what Paul is attacking in the chapter 1 at the beginning. He says, don't go to that place. On the other hand, there are Jewish people in the city who are also believing Jesus Christ and say, we need Jesus, but we need to do all these practices that the Jewish people have been doing for centuries. Let's practice that. So Paul comes to this, take this thing, and he says, that is not so. If you have received Jesus Christ as the Lord, you need to be rooted in Christ. There is no other platform. There is no other philosophy that you need to mix it with. And he says, be rooted in Christ, be built up in him, strengthened in faith, and overflowing with thanksgiving. This Colossian believers has already received Jesus Christ, but as they were mixing it up, Paul comes to this and says, believers, you need to remember that Jesus is the one who took you over. You are in Christ and you need to be rooted in Christ. And what he uses, these four imageries, that's what I want to focus on. The four imageries, number one, being rooted in him. Number two, is built up in him. Number three, is strengthened in the faith. Number four, overflowing with thanksgiving. Today, in this message, I will not have time to look through all the four. Let's try to look at the first two. Rooted imagery is an imagery from the agricultural farming community. Second one, built up, is an architectural imagery. We have an architect sitting right in front of me, and I can ask him what that is. There are farmers in this community as well. Rooted and built up. The strengthened one, the word that actually used in the Greek is called the word established. It's a legal imagery. In a court of law, people would actually bind something and put together as a law that to practice. That's the established. Established in him. And overflowing is an imagery of an overflowing cup, a wine cup that's been full and is overflowing. There are four imageries that Paul uses. Let's look at what these two first two imageries are. The first imagery is an imagery of the agriculture. When we look at a tree that is full of fruits, what we see is only the trunk, the tree the tree trunk, the leaves, and the flowers, and the fruits. We don't think a lot about how that tree is blossom in season, and season after season, and produces fruit. We don't 
think a lot about it because we are just interested about the fruit of the tree. But there is something that happens every season, whether you know it or you know, don't know it, or you believe it or not, there's something that is happening for the tree. Every tree that is growing and is blossoming and giving fruit has a system that we do not see that's going down. And this is the picture of the tree that is going down with its root. If these true roots are not going down, we will not see any fruit. In fact, the health of every tree is dependent on how healthy the tree roots are. Just before this summer, we went to uh, India and we had a beautiful tree in our living room, ornamental tree, and it was growing in a lot of leaves and it was so beautiful to see. A month later when we came back and we saw there was no more leaves in the tree. It's dead. In fact, today morning, our IE told me, so this tree is already dead. We need to just take it out. Because the roots were not able to bring in what it needs for the growth of the tree. And the tree died. The roots are what, the, 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 what take the water and the micronutrients from the ground that help the tree grow and make it fruitful. Paul uses this imagery to encourage Christians. It is not just enough to be planted and sprouted. God's word is planted in you. Don't stop there. You need to grow your roots, go beyond. I think I've told you this story some time ago when we were staying in Changjiang uh, area in my third floor apartment, I would look at these trees outside on the uh, side of Longdong Avenue. Every winter I see this tree has absolutely no leaves and the height has gone a little down because all the leaves are gone. And I'm just looking at, waiting for the spring to come. And I saw every spring, this tree has grown, not just to the previous level, it's grown another feet up. And I was wondering, I thought this tree is dead in the winter with cold winter and frost setting in. But what was happening, what I do not know, is that every winter it came, the tree went down its root. It, it went deeper and got what it needed. Jesus said to John in John 15, he says, unless you continue to abide in me, you cannot produce fruit. We as Christians are tree that is growing. Jesus used the imagery of wine and he says, I am the vine and you the branches. If you do not remain in me, you cannot produce fruit because the vine has roots. And he uses that image to tell us what it means to be rooted. The second imagery is about the building up part. This is the picture of the uh, financial tower, sorry, Shanghai Tower. Can you show the next picture, please? The Shanghai Tower which was not there when we moved into Shanghai several years ago. And I put this picture alongside. This is the basement that, or the, the foundation of that building. And it took years and years for engineers and architects and people to build what is unseen so that when the seen part comes out, it can stay. Again, this is an amazing, amazing structure that is built to withstand even up to 8.5 um, richer scale earthquakes because that foundation is built in such a way that even an earthquake comes, it can swing back and forth, but it cannot collapse. That's what they made for because they have tested it for different, uh, uh, different mathematical equations to, to find out what it can withstand. This is how Christian's life is. Paul uses these two, uh, two imageries to tell us we, you and I, are called to live our life rooted and built up in Christ Jesus. The question is, why should we be rooted? Why should we 
have strong foundation. What is the importance of this? I've just mentioned to you, the tree that does not have roots in it, it will not be fruitful. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 and 8 says, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its root by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green, it has no worries in an year of drought, and never fails to bear fruit. What an amazing picture they're talking about. The one who is rooted in Christ is like a tree that is planted by the waters. Unless we are rooted, we cannot be fruitful. Being rooted in Christ is what brings fruit of Christ in us. The second reason why we need to be rooted and established in the, in, the, in the foundation is that the only way that we can withstand adversary, adversities is our foundation is strong. This was taken, this picture was taken in 2009, not too far from here, when one small, it is not even a tremor, the whole building, a 13-story building has come down just like that and we found out that building did not have enough foundation nor had long root uh, uh, piling that goes down. Jesus talks about storms that comes to our life. He says he takes the example of two people. One is a wise man and a, a man who is foolish. Both of them are building homes, building houses. One was the wise man built it on the rock and the foolish man built it on the sand and both of them hit by the storm. Storms are inevitable. Let me tell you, just as Christians, as we have come to know Jesus, don't think that because I am in Christ, I will not have any storm. A lot of people think that, okay, now that I'm a Christian, I have no problem. That is not the theology that Jesus talks about it. We are going to hit as much as hitting as the other people are going to hit. But the difference is that if our root has gone down, if our foundation is stable, we will not be falling down. We can stand any adversities. And the question is, Pastor, you're talking about being rooted in Christ, being built up in Christ. What does it mean to me in practical terms? What does it mean to be rooted in Christ? I want to share with you three aspects of being rooted in Christ. Number one, being rooted in Christ means rooted in his love. Rooted in his love. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 to 19 says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the full measure of God. God wants us to be rooted in his love. God showed us that what is love through Christ and when we are in him, we are actually going to be filled with his love. It's just like a sponge is put into the water, immersed into the water. What happened? This water is getting absorbed and absorbed until the place that cannot hold it anymore. And that is the life of a Christian who is in Christ. The more I come, allow Jesus Christ to work in my life, I become more and more like him in the way he loves the people. Rooted in Christ is rooted in his love. Apostle Paul says, this fruit of the Holy Spirit love manifests in us through multifold forms. Let me give you one example. This, when we start living in his love, what happens to our joy? In adversities comes God's love that is going to be manifested in the form of love, in the form of joy, and in the form of peace, in the form of patience, because we're going to face everyday challenges. If we are filled with the love, we, our responses are going to be different. In John 15, Jesus says, if you abide in me 
and my words abide in you, you will be fruitful. When you are in Christ, you become like Christ. Wine and the branches, Jesus says, when we look at a wine with branches, we don't look at the branch and say, that's a branch that is giving the fruit. We look at that and say, the wine is giving fruit for us. In other words, when we start to live in Jesus, people start to see and experience Jesus' love in and through our life. Friends, this is the way we know we are children of God if we love one another. Jesus said, the love is the witnessing thing. Second thing that he talks about, the world will know that you are the children of God. You are my disciples when we start overflowing in that love. Paul says, the love of Christ compels me to witness Jesus in places who have not heard gospel. It motivates me to speak the truth in love. In Ephesians chapter 4, Apostle Paul says, when you come together, don't just keep it for yourself. I want you to be speaking the truth in love to one another. This love of God in us is going to change the way my behavior, my thinking, my interaction, and in my, my, all my relationship. This is what is going to take the primary place, the love of Christ. Number two is what rooted in Christ means is also rooted in his word. I have taken this scripture from first, uh, the Psalms 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his day, Lord, day and night. And then says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. When we start to meditate God's word and when we start to apply God's word, God is going to bring fruitfulness in our life. Fruitfulness is a result of dwelling in his word. I speak to a lot of young people and also old people and we talk about why we do not see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us and we simply ask them how much time you spend in the word of God. They say, well, I don't have time for reading the word. I don't have time for meditating the word. There's no wonder why we do not see the fruit of the Holy Spirit coming to us. Because all the time that we spend in time is all the philosophies, all the ideas, and the, all the ideologies of this world. If the word of God is not transforming us, we cannot expect to produce fruit that is of Christ. The dwelling of the word of God does many things. I've taken these four things. Number one, the word of God makes me fruitful, both in quality and in quantity. Jesus says in chapter 15 of John, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will be fruitful. And he continued that passage and he says, you will be much fruitful and fruit that lasteth. If we want to have a quality, and the quantity of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We need to meditate the word of God. Word of God also guards me from falling into sin. In Psalm 119 verse 8 and 9. The writer says. Lord. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. The word of God is so powerful to help us to be not only fruitful, but also able to help us from falling into sin. Every time, this is one of the work of the Holy Spirit, amazingly, the word of God which is hidden in us in every times of temptations and trials, the word of God is reminded by the Holy Spirit. It keeps us from falling into sin. It empowers me to speak against the enemy's lies. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Jesus didn't say any compromise with the, with the enemy. He said, it is written. 
It is written that I will not do it because the word of God was written not only as on a paper printed in the Bible. Jesus was saying, it is written in my heart. I cannot go. And he says to the enemy, get behind me, Satan, because he was using the power of the word of God. Word of God also equipped me to serve other people. It is what equips me to do what God wants me to do. When I come together in the church, we just prayed for one another a few minutes ago. Why do we do that? Because when I come together, I want to pray God's promises over people. I want to minister to people through the word of God. In the same book, chapter 3, verse 16, uh, Colossians says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When the word of God is dwelling in us richly, we can encourage and edify one another through the word of God. There's a word of encouragement. There's a word of wisdom. There's a word of knowledge that God uses to give to us to build other people's life. And number three, rooted in Christ also means rooted in the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes we do not think about this. How does rooting in the Holy Spirit matter to me? All of Apostle Paul's writing and the resurrected Jesus commandments is about living in the Holy Spirit. He says, I want you to be led by the Holy Spirit. I want to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I want to keep you keeping in the step with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a few examples. I'm quickly running this, uh, this part of this, the, the message. When Jesus was going into the wilderness, Luke writes very beautifully, and he says, Jesus was led to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was coming out of the wilderness, Holy Spirit says, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to this particular place in the Nazareth uh, synagogue to preach. And when Jesus stood up and he preached this, the Holy Spirit is upon me. He has anointed me. And the Holy Spirit leads from one place to another place. Every time we look at Jesus' life, we see the leading of the Holy Spirit. He was always being led by the Holy Spirit. Now, is it only for Jesus? Let's look at Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul went on his first missionary journey. He planted churches in Asia Minor region that we talked about, all these Asian cities. And on his second journey, Naturally, he wanted to go to the Asia, Asian region. So he started his journey and he came to a particular city. He said, I want to go and preach the gospel there. There are three reasons at least. Number one, I have been there and I know the place, my experience. I've experienced to go to that place. Number two, there are already believers that he wants to encourage. There's nothing wrong. He wants to go to that place and encourage the believers. That's what he said. Let's go and encourage the believers there. Number three, always preaching the gospel. There are more places to cover. And so he decided to go. But as he was waiting in a particular city, the Holy Spirit spoke to him to not go. It's very interesting that his desire is to go, there is need there, and he has experience. And there's nothing wrong in going to a particular place. But the Holy Spirit spoke to him very clearly, do not go. And he just waited and prayed again. And the second time they said, okay, let's go again. Holy Spirit said, do not go. And then he started kind of feeling, what is the, that spirit of God that you want to speak to me? And as he was in either sleeping or in the night, he saw a vision. In the vision, he saw a man from the other side of the sea, from Europe, in Macedonia, a man telling, please come here and help us. He knew Holy Spirit was speaking. And as a result, he for the very first time went to Europe and met this group of women in the city of Philippi, and shared the gospel and planted the first church. And let me tell you, the first church of Europe was planted because Paul was willing to the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
Isn't that amazing that you who are Christian, just because you know the word of God, just because we see the need there, you don't do things because you want to hear, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? And when you become so sensitive and being led every moment, you will see an amazing result that you will not be able to see other times. And, and the word of God says, I warn you to be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus did every single miracle because Holy Spirit has led him. Every time he preached, the Holy Spirit has led him. He casted out demons because the Holy Spirit has led him. In Acts chapter 8, there's another simple brother. You know, he's not an apostle. He's not Jesus. His name is Philip. When the persecution came in Rome, Philip said, okay, I want to go to Samaria and start a church there. And he started doing a church and the church started growing amazingly. A lot of miracles started happening. This is not even an apostle. A brother who was helping in the table, serving food. He went there and started a church and miracles happening and demons leaving and healing happening. And one day, the Holy Spirit came to him and spoke to him. I want you to go to that empty road that leads to Gaza. Philip literally obeyed him. And he is going through this empty road that leads to Gaza. If you know that Gaza Strip, it's the place that disconnects the, uh, the African continent with the Middle East. And he was going through this road and suddenly there was a man, an African guy from Ethiopia who went to Jerusalem, is coming that road. And as he was coming to the road, he is listening to the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God says, go closer to this, this chariot. And you know, chariot has been ridden by horses and you can't walk with it. You are running. And as Philip started running with it, the guy asked, do you want to come? You want to come up here? And he was reading the scroll of Isaiah. Philip goes into that at the chariot and explains to him, do you understand what you're reading? It's Isaiah. And from that passage, Philip explained to him what it, believes, to, what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. And then that journey, he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. Philip asked the chariot to be stopped and given baptism. And the guy went to Ethiopia. The first church in, in, in Africa started. But the Holy Spirit amazingly did something else. If I was in Philip's place, I would come back to my previous home church and continue the church. But we don't see Philip coming because the Holy Spirit told him to go to another place. And start a church there. Isn't that amazing? That to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit is your counselor. He is your teacher. He is your guide. He is your helper. He is your advocate. And he is available for you and me. If I train myself. My spiritual antennas goes up. And I can hear the Holy Spirit speak. I can be rooted in Christ. And I can be led like the Holy Spirit. Paul writes to Galatians church and he says, you have began your journey in the spirit. Now, are you trying to finish your race in the flesh that you want to listen to yourself? Don't do that. Who has bewitched you? Who has done a witchcraft on you that you move from spirit to the flesh to your own self? Church, I want to challenge you this year. Take your time to read and meditate the word of God. Be rooted in the word and let the fruit of the Holy Spirit come out of you and people see that you are a disciple because you speak the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You speak in love. You speak in truth. You speak the love language of Christ. Let us be rooted in his love. Let, it be, let us be rooted in his word. And let us be rooted in in the Holy Spirit. The question is, are you being rooted and built up in Christ? I pose three questions to you to ponder. Do you see the love of God transforming your life into Christ-likeness? Do you experience this love of God? Are you taking roots in his love? Do you see the work of the flesh is now being put away and the fruit of the Holy Spirit is filling your heart? Where is your root? Is it in the world or is it in the word? Where are you being built up? 
on the sand that is so shaky the things of this world that are shaky or are you building your life on the rock of ages how are you being being led are you being led by your thoughts your imaginations your ambitions your desires or are you being led by the holy spirit my first question before you leave from this place where are you being rooted are you being rooted think about it as you go back home ask this question in your family prayer time when you meet together as a life group as a small group then spend some time asking this question are we being rooted if so where are we being rooted the second question i want to ask you about are you being a helper for helping other people getting rooted we are not only being rooted as christians we are also helping one another there is no reason for this church if we don't have any care for one another we can practice our if we can practice our christianity at our homes we don't need to be here for 2 hours speak somebody speaking to you about it it is because we are called to be in a family and caring for one another now we talked about a few minutes ago we are looking for people to serve in different ministries i want to in highlight four different ministries that we are now really really looking for people to help one another we have a youth ministry we have about 50 children between the age of 11 and 18 in our community and i've been asking and praying to the lord lord i want to help these children been rooted in you rooted in the holy spirit rooted in the word and rooted in your love but i need people i need people who are willing to step up i know who are sitting here many of you have your middle school and high school age children who are, who is going to invest in their life who is going to help them be rooted if you are not willing we've been praying that god we need a youth pastor for some time and we still keep asking but in the meantime i want people to stand up and say i want to serve last week somebody came uh, after such a service and said pastor i want to serve in your youth ministry i was so challenged to hear i was so happy to hear that someone who comes only one month ago into a community because he felt that he want to invest his life into the life of young people in our community we want bible study leaders we want people to organize food when they come together on a friday night please contact me or one of our youth youth uh, volunteers or kaleen our kids director and say i want to serve in our youth ministry second thing i want to talk about is university ministry i want to ask people here sitting here if you are a university student could you please stand up if you are a university student in shanghai can you please stand please stand If you are a university student please stand Please I know there are other other university students here if you are going to any university here please stand up here These young people young men and women who are coming from two dozen countries of the world they are here for a year or two please be seated These men and women are coming to us into this city because this is their season to study There was a time about a few years ago we had 100 plus students from 30 different countries here and they are here for a year or two they are children of god who wanted to be rooted and i have been asking people would you lead this ministry in this church to invest life into this people when they are here out one or two years when they go back to other places will they be global citizens of christ we have 100 men in our community I've been asking many several men this last whole year would you please lead the men's ministry sometimes my heart is broken because we are so busy in our world we want to protect our time it's all good friends as the travel comes as a lot of things that are happening in our community we need more prayers we need more fellowship we need more encouragement i want to challenge you men in our community 
If we don't have an accountability before God, we are just one step away from falling. I want to challenge you this year. Take it as a mandate on you. And tell the Lord, Lord, I want to not only be rooted in Christ, I want to help somebody else be rooted. We've been talking about prayer and intercession ministry. There are a lot of needs in the church that we are still looking for people to come up and gather together and pray and intercede, not only for the church, but for individuals as well. Friends, we have a calling and a purpose to be rooted in Christ and to root other people in Christ. Let's stand and pray. Ask the Lord, God, here I am. Will you open your hearts before God and say, God, this new year, I want to be rooted in you. I want to experience your love in much more tangible way this year, Lord. I want to experience your joy, your peace in my life, Lord. I want to be rooted in your love. And I want to help other people rooted in the love by expressing the love in terms of helping people, serving people. Lord, I want to be rooted in your word. I will make every opportunity available to read and meditate your word and help other people by reading together, by studying together, deepening my relationship with you, Lord. Lord, I want to place my life before you to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I want to walk in you, Lord. Will you make that commitment? Friends, as we are going to pray, I want to give you this challenge and ask you, Lord, ask you people, if you are willing to step one step and say, God, this is my commitment today, would you raise your right hand and say, God, I want to be rooted this year in Christ. I want to be rooted in Christ. And I want to help other people be rooted in Christ. Friends, this is not just an emotional appeal. This is not an emotional appeal. I want to take this truth to my heart and say, God, here I am committing myself to be rooted in you, Lord. Father, you are seeing these hands. You are seeing these hearts. These lives are precious to you. Much more than it is precious to me. I commit each one of them who are praying this morning, this evening with me that they be rooted in Christ. Holy Spirit, help them to walk in step with you. Holy Spirit, reveal your word to them. Continue to build their life, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen.